the winter room. Baskets of wool, unfinished rows on double zeros. Admittance to you, unlikely. But if I lift the latch, you may knit while I tear back through frost, knee deep in nights of snow. Did you know sap hardens just like that, the snap of heartwood? Winter is drift, moth bit, ignition's dead click, the dream of freezing. If you arrive and I unlock, promise, promise you will not bring me seeds to plant in spring. As Cami mentioned, I grew up in New Hampshire in a place where there was a network of very magical lakes and I did a fair amount of growing up there. So the next two poems I read are going to be about some of those lakes. Watching for frogs on Spoonwood Pond. I strip down to startle white, wade in, spine bent to watch for sticks and rocks, my glasses in the woods inside one shoe. All winter I have lived with ice, warmed my blood in silt and muck. At first sign of hay-scented ferns, I emerge, rise to air freckled with flies. There's a rope swing, an eagle's nest, nailed to a tree, a faded sign points to the portage, to you as you carry through with your canoe. Do you not see my pile of clothes on last year's bed of pine? A deer fly lands a bite above your right eye as if surprised, as if it too did not recognize your face. When girls swim, we made it to the lake and back, calling and breathing hard in June, the water cold, our muscles soft after the closet of a long winter. You looked back and later said you thought I might drown. unleashed your top, aspired to some aloha life, as if we could ever break beyond the edge of this clear lake inside a wood, but oh, you could, you could. And this is uh, one of the poems about touching um, and sort of the extent that we might go to, to avoid touching. Low line. No limbo stick licks my upturned chest. No fence wire barbs my back. Low as a leech in cattails, a rat snake in corn stalks. Oh, the things I walk under to be able to say I've crossed, passed, come out the other side without touching, without being touched. Uh, several years ago, um, some friends gave me this book called 
the world without us by Matthew, Matthew White, White, sorry, by Alan Weissman. Um, and it's, it's basically that. It's a story of what different parts of the world would look like if man suddenly disappeared from it. And um, I've, I've heard that book mentioned in several articles that I've read lately in, in kind of the context of the um, backing off of man's footprint on the earth. So I, I wrote this poem, it's, it's sort of a, a micro look at that. Backache, a love song. Lie down with me on the hard floor for relief. My spine, a dried bone, a child could split on a wish. Discover the dust beneath the couch, treasure of our skin and desert duff. Stay long enough. Let the honeysuckle take the cellar window, crawl the gap between door and threshold, that through space where winds broadcast leaves and seeds, lizards skitter in, out. Let the vines reclaim us as if a leaning fence, a creaking barn, you and I on the floor reposed, our hard won clear repossessed. The other um, Thing that we've been hearing a lot about in the news is the way um, animals have, wild animals, have started to reclaim their spaces in national parks, in neighborhoods. Um, so this is, this is um, a poem about that and it's also a fire poem because no California poet uh, worth her salt, has not written a fire poem. Coyote fire. At night, he trots over rooftops, leaves scat on the porch, sets the screen door swinging. It's the cat he wants, but I give him water in a bowl gold as a hunter's moon. I've built my house on his creek, untangled the trees in his forest. Now I drink from his bowl, offer my fingers for him to lick. He circles and snaps at the back of my thigh. I am the creek bed crackling with drought, the tinder for his amber eyes. I am wild, his wild now. And I'm just going to read one more poem from my book and then um, a new poem. This poem is uh, for my husband. Myth carved in a coffee table, the trouble with interpretation. Alone in Bali, my husband cuts a deal with a carver, ships a table home to me in upstate New York. It's a myth, he says on the phone, a carving of the good king, the bad king, and their interpreters. The table arrives and I see the good king has shot the bad king in the neck, arrow straight to the gullet. The interpreters lend no help. Small men with mouths like boars, they tussle on the jungle floor. One yanks the top knot of the other who opens his mouth to scream but boasts no words of his own. That's the problem with the job, that and life in a jungle, war and murder. How lovely the table looks 
in our living room. So one, one more poem, and as I said, this is brand new, and I don't know um, how many of you received this uh, postcard from our president um, about it's President Trump's coronavirus guidelines for America. And I was angry when I got the postcard because it was too little too late and the money spent, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided that I would every day look at it and do a different erasure or redaction of it, um, thinking that I would come up with something very snarky. And But I was surprised at what I came up. So this is just a series of very short poems that came about from redacting this postcard. And I'm calling it coronavirus.gov. Listen, you are tested, your hands especially. Away from other people, you are drinking, touching your face. You are an older person, home inside your elbow. Do not go shopping. Someone in your household is eating, especially frequently. Do your part, slow the spread. You stay home, do not go to work. Your children sneeze into frequently used items. Surface as much as possible. Even if you are young, stay serious. Avoid pickup. America, keep an older person. Gather up good. After, slow the work of eating, drinking. Touch, touch as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. That was beautiful. You're welcome. Uh, I had said people could sort of wave their hands in the, the uh, signing of applause since we can't really clap. I don't know how many people we can see at this point, but thank you very much, Mary. Um, before I go on, I wanted to just remind people that if you look at the chat, which is um, something you can click on at the bottom of your screen, there's a little thing that says chat, you will see information about how to find the books of the writers tonight. And I wanted to say that for poets, it's actually quite important to buy books. You might not think that at a reading it would be such a big deal, but especially now that everything's shut down uh, and these publishing houses are really, little houses are suffering and the readings, a lot of readings have been canceled, please do buy books. If you like what you hear tonight, please, please do that. And also each of these writers has a website so you can always locate the books there. Um, again, that was Mary Brown. Um, I see people are using the chat and that's great. I just think it would probably be good to not use the chat while the poets are reading, but in between while I'm jabbering, please feel free. Um, okay, our next reader is Matthew Lippman. His collection, Mesmerizingly Sadly Beautiful, won the 2018 Levis Prize and will be published by Four Way Books in 2020. His recent collection of spring 
from Matthew's uh, Mesmerizingly Sadly Beautiful. This is from a poem right before the poem called That Is Why You Have to Buy Your Kid Astral Weeks. And I just must say that's one of my favorite record albums in the world. So I was so happy to find it in Matt Matthew's book. All right, so a quote. It's a good sign to feel this way, that the land can still work its baselines on my body, that the country is getting better every day. Matthew. Thank you, Cammie. It's great to be here with you and Mary and Jacob and Matt and Carrie and Christine. So uh, I'm going to read a couple of poems from um, my new book, which is out now, Mesmerizingly Sadly Beautiful, published by Four Way Books. The first poem is called uh, A First Love, A First True Love Big Problem. My problem is that I think every conversation is filled with love and the big heart. It's the same thing that happens to me when I stand near a tree or open a pint of rum raisin. It becomes everything and I love it. If we talk about Jesus or hamburgers, it's a love story, even though I don't believe in genuflecting and cook a mean medium rare on the open grill. My problem is that when I stand with you, near you, and we talk about the bad political situation, it's like you are telling me that every wind you have ever felt, you felt with me. Every log cabin you ever built, you built with me. This means we got bloody and sweaty together. It means we had something beautiful and dirty together. So when we talk about getting the gutters cleaned or how cool that cloud is next to the window looking to get inside, we are bloody and sweaty together. My problem is that this happens the first time we talk ever in the histories of our lives in the body electric gone berserk. It's a true love problem. It's a first true love big problem, and there is nothing I can do about it. It's how my lungs and blood and bad eyesight and overweight snoring all fit in together. Excuse me then if I want something back from you in that moment, when we share a table at Starbucks and have words about what bus you might need to get to take you to the opera house. It is not fair. It is not right of me, I know it, but I have a problem. It's a first love into a lonely love, last love problem. There's too much of it in my heart, and I want everyone to have it, all of us. That's my problem, it's huge. It gets me in so much trouble. Do you feel it? Forgive me if I want you to have it too. Um, I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read for, uh, Cammy the Astral Weeks poem, <laughs> which is my favorite record ever of all time ever. Um, and, uh, it's called, that is why you have to buy your kid Astral Weeks. Sick and tired of the fault lines in Hawaii and California, the plants and trees and the cat at our window. Sick and tired of bad Russians and crazy wife beaters, the way the moon hangs in the sky, the manager of the Walmart, all the... Selling the apple people, buy, sell, reap, kill, maim, extort, defile. Mostly sick and tired of anxiety, how it ruins the flora and birds, the young people.
the only thing that doesn't bring me down. I hope the earth makes it. I hate feeling that I hope the earth will make it. That's why you have to buy your kid astral weeks and hope she'll open the shrink wrap, lay down on her bed and listen to ballerina a hundred times before there's even that faint feeling. I'm tired and sick of this song. The needle used to be a forever thing inside a groove. Not so much these days, look outside. Dreams used to hang on the tips of flowers. You could go up to them with your whole face, suck them like bees, then return to your brothers and sisters in the hive with so much buzzing, it was honey. It was good when there was all that honey. The bees thick with themselves, so much so it didn't matter. It's spring and we're inside and I'm a huge baseball fan and I'm very sad that there's no baseball. Um, so here's a poem about baseball. It's actually about Roberto Clemente, who was the uh, star outfielder for the Pittsburgh Pirates in the late 60s and early 70s. He died in a plane crash on New Year's Eve. He was bringing uh, supplies to Puerto Rico and uh, there was too much, um, the plane was too heavy and it crashed into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. This is a poem called, The Ocean is a Flower Called Roberto Clemente. Roberto Clemente kicked my ass last night. He came out of the darkness like a train whistle with his 21 Pittsburgh jersey tucked in and laid me out with a left hook. I fell to the grass and screamed, what's your problem, Roberto? Couldn't sleep, he said. Get a motel, I said. He said, my plane crashed, I am dead. Go home, I said. He said, I come from Carolina, Puerto Rico. So what's the problem, I asked. He said, my name is Roberto. I have three sons and 3,000 base hits. My name is Roberto Clemente. And when his plane took off from San Juan, overloaded with bananas and gauze for the earthquake victims of Managua, it was New Year's Eve, and his eyes were bloodshot bullets under the canopy of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, sorry. Ah. When the sharks got their teeth into him, the turtles, the manatees and stingrays, the vapor trail of his gate around second base brushed back the wind. 10 hours later, my father woke me to say, El Padre, Roberto, no longer swings for the fences. I was seven. I have been seven ever since. And I will, uh, I'll finish up with a small, uh, a poem, um, called, uh, what is it called? War is not healthy for children and other living things. I grew up in the, um, in the early 70s and uh, there was a lot of anti-war protesting going on. Um, and one of the icons, the artistic icons of the time was a poster uh, that was uh, made by Lorraine Schneider um, and the poster said, war is not healthy for children and other living things. And uh, this is that poem. Aliza said she found the poster in her parents' basement or attic and had it framed. It was water damaged. I could see the brown stains that reminded me of the brown stains that fly across the sky and the country and the playground, and the face of the guy next door with all the rifles. We had that poster too in our apartment in 1970 and 1974 and 80 and 86, carried around to remind us what needn't be reminded. I don't know when my parents got rid of it, but it never left me. When I was a kid, we all wore the button on our jean jackets, even when we fell off the monkey bars and the pin rammed into our chests, like we knew something and we did. We didn't care. We were that kind of kid. We wanted to do something important, be important, show the world that Orange Crush was the joint soda 
and Wacky Pax and Marvin Gaye were the joint soda. And we meant something. We did. And when I saw that poster in the frame on Aliza and Daniel's wall, I was upset that it was not on my wall for my children. Sometimes your parents can give you something and you don't even know it until you know it. And then it's yours. In 1972, it was mine and we were children and we were other living things, lizards and mosquitoes. We were frogs and elephants and sycamore trees. We were our sisters and our brothers and our neighbors. And you know what? We knew it. Because every night when we turned on the TV to watch Rocky and Bullwinkle or Adam West as Batman, there was Dan Rather or Peter Jennings from Hanoi on the rice patties of hell. I am sad tonight that I did not save the water damaged poster of that flower, which my parents hung on our walls, that sketch made by Lorraine Schneider. She died of cancer in 1972 and I miss her. We all miss you, Lorraine. Our posters are stained brown now on these walls, on the backs of our eyes, like tattoos. And we give them to our children. We say to them, here, take this flower. It is for you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming out for staying in <laughs> tonight. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was beautiful. Um, I wanted to just remind everybody that you can find the uh, access to the books in the chat. And please do feel free to write in the chat if you'd like in between readers. And then again at the end where there'll be a Q&A, a short one, and people can comment at that time. Our last reader. On Ye Magazine, Salamander Magazine, Southern Humanities Review, Blackbird, and others. I have again a couple of spring lines from Jacob's new book. This is from the poem Richard's story. Sunflowers, he said, swayed golden in the drifts, what he had planted once and come up since. Jacob. Hi. Um, Thank you, Cami and uh, Christine and uh, Matt uh, for, for putting this together and to the Cary Memorial Library, of course, for, for having all of us. It's a real pleasure to uh, read with Mary and, and Matthew. Um, my, my book of poems, my, I should say my debut book, uh, The Land of the Dead is Open for Business, um, uh, tries to attend to the uh, legacy of the extractive industries, um, coal, oil, uh, maybe logging, uh, and the mag migration of young people out of my uh, home state of West Virginia. Uh, and I count myself among that number of, of those who've left. I want to start uh, today with a poem called uh, Mother's Day. And um, for those of you who don't know, Mother's Day originated in West Virginia. Um, the very first Mother's Day was held on May 10th in 1908 in Grafton. And this is Mother's Day. Dig for potatoes, brush the earth from their faces. Under the tap, scrub them with wool like smoke as the television scrolls with names, white letters.
the knife works them into halves, then quarters of themselves, then nothing. When you push them from the cutting board, scald your arm, wince, and sweep the rest with the knife's edge. This is necessary. It isn't the only thing left with which to fill your day, but nearly. It's nearly the only thing. And uh, speaking of uh, migration uh, out of the state of West Virginia, um, one of the older poems in the book, um, older and newer, I suppose, is uh, Monongahela, Allegheny Cold. Let me say it again. Monongahela, Allegheny Coldfield. The season turned them out on their heads. The kids flicked butts at the tipple and tracks with Whalen on the radio, shirt sleeves cut free and blew through quick as pickup slipping the valves of some mountain trumpet rising chord on chord like pines, like blasted fill, high lonesome sound of high school football fields and higher still shrinking in the belly of the air over a city or great lake unknown to these horizons strung three times tree to tree. Near the wasp-spangled tool shed, paper bloat of an August harvest, someone regretted each and every year he held onto them like a stone turning in his belly. He held the answer, heard the burden once lifted in the wind. They be gone for good, no chance they stay. Uh, but I'm going to follow the, uh, the Mother's uh, Day thread a little bit further. Um, mothers appear in this book. I'm actually, once I started looking for it, I was really surprised to see how many times um, mothers show up, um, even in a grotesque form, uh, as in this poem, uh, Appalachia Grotesque. Drop from your shoulders the sky, purpling down a scented hayfield, my buddies and I strode rowdy and blaze orange. We plied the thicket for blighted chestnut, walnut, seed husks, bursting rapture, and the union sock. How low our rifles swung, parting unmown meadows, our hips and thighs collecting dew, branches unshaken. In the breaks, we were boys and would set fire to our mistakes. Couldn't help it, mother. The leaning grass I seized, the thin roots kissed and drove my hands across your knees, born in the bark's black sibilant cataract. Drop the sky, and while I hold you, spill and lie back in the crook of a maple, blistered, ripe, only promise your key fruit and crown me in your lap. Uh, the next poem is uh, called, She Longed to Be a Bird, White Tail, Stray Dog. Sliding out crooked in the birth night of summer, screen door thrum, aluminum siding in the porch light. She pulls apart the barbed wire fence, torn tail and mane brush her throat. She crouches into the darkest pasture and do wet passages downhill for the pond below that a farmer backhoed decades before. And further down, a run over spills with newborn crawdads and the blacker than black shale on shale. Her porch light blazes and whimpers. A solitary trunk as cold as a branch shoved in mud shares the pond side. She was her husband slipping for years to different corners of the yard. She was her children the ridge lines crossed through. Their absence pulls in the diesel track. Gentle fingers gesture to the run and the blacker than black and the thrill. The next poem um, refers to a compressor plant uh, that was built in the last 10 years, maybe a little less, uh, on, on Fork Ridge to support the gas industry that's really grown up around um, uh, the, the industry built around the Marcellus Shale 
uh, deposit. Um, it's made life uh, awfully hard for a lot of people there. It's called Fork Ridge Right-of-Way. A Toyota-shaped slipstream plucks the tines of dying maples between the blacktop and the new compressor plant. Their clumps of clawed leaves wither, weight, copper, hopewell, spearmen for the burn. My mother at the wheel asks politely, why don't I move back? You murderous, blessed, clinkant compressor plant, you hypertrophic tin man cathedral perfected, microchip perfected, child of the smokestacks west on the river nosing stars, you forked tongue of the hills, deaf, unmetaphorical, and grieved, bare-breasted and diademed, our haute couture, most complete poem. It's as if you allow us to take the turn. It's as if you count your family complete. The fox in the dead of the night compromises coop and hutch, coop and hutch as new pipelines cut a farm's hills square and wages blow through beautiful as dirt hanging in the air. How I hold mom's hand in mine before she steals away. <clears throat> one more uh, mother's poem, though this one, uh, this one it foregrounds a, a ritual that uh, we're all missing this spring or will soon be missing in May. Commencement Day, Banks of the Ohio. Splitting that stratum from the Ohio, we were a speck of white harnessed to the mid-May weighted skies. Imagine they are waiting for us. You said, us to test the dark ribbon pulling us outward as route two wed the mined out hill we rounded in your Subaru. White knuckled, I imagined, loving the bridge of your lips, pressing bobby pins in the basement of a church. The bouquet gathered up as my heart slipped from its saddle of ribs beside the river, a smokestack, a landscape cleft. This could be my apology. Rising ahead, a kingbird shakes his foil out on the turn. Sister constellations open like crocuses. Working men holler, whip up their caps, beckon your fingers, your hand to my hand. White celebration. I said nothing, still can't. With long, unmoving faces, our families sit mother to mother watching the door for a sign. So much of the decision to write a poem, uh, at least for me, or actually the decision to, to write poems at all, uh, in my case, comes from the stories I heard um, at home growing up. And so I'm gonna switch over to the one uh, Cammie started us off with, Richard's story. Something startled the horses out of winter. Buckets, sugar tap, ice-covered salt lick. A man collapsed on metal runners, dragged his balled-up fists in the snow. Two lines, his face blue and deepening blue, hauled through the hollow. The mares looked for from a kitchen window, processed their revelation over the white and stopped in yellow flowers, stupid-eyed, tonguing their bits. The sound of shaken tack, the only sound, this winter garden birdless, and the boy waking someone up beside the stove, her cries, a dog's upended dream in a thicket. It was an old, old story, he said. Sunflowers, he said, swayed golden in the drifts. What he had planted once and come up since. And I'm now going to uh, switch uh, over to poems I, I might call uh, poems of witness. Um, 
this is an elegy for a man who is not dead yet. Um, the epigraph of the poem is a line from uh, his website, the uh, former Massey Cole CEO, Don Blankenship. It reads, in short, my life has been a great one. It's called The Assumption. A lead horse hangs his head, reins and harness slip, tillage waits like dead Don Blankenship, whose lions leap the hog's backs, whose river overruns the coal train on her tracks. No one's, no one's. The worm sleeps in a rose, a hunter in the blind, and when the shutters close for only wind, lives are short, not how we should be. Uh, this month marks the 10th anniversary of Beds and boots await the morning light gravel clack, air pulsing over teeming barns. Beware, the wind will thicken with them, strike squarely the legislator's eye, finger his intake of breath, refuse all circumlocution. New man trips hum and a doe slips through the mountain pass as tin roofed houses shiver under the euphemism wrongful death. From the hillsides bristling, the wind will thicken with them, indict the chief executive hoisted in his tree stand of thought. And I'd like to end with the final poem in the book, um, one I wrote for my friend, Mike Iafrate. It's called Five String. Cole sings somewhere inside us fathers, a black furnace, blesses our kids, buries mountain-like vows, and the rest banjoing between midwives, your new discord. Claw the bridge or burn what your girl tomorrow will hear. Thread that thought, you have no choice. Peg it, tighten so it twitches with the heat of choice. You'll touch that stirring until blisters. Thanks very much.